Imagine a world where cities run under the benign guidance of an AI. Robots plant and harvest our food, and nanotechnology performs what seem like medical miracles. People hack their own genes, connect their brains to the internet, and implant tech to experience the world in ways humans have never known. Travel and even living on other planets is no longer a fantasy, but a matter of affordability. While these scenarios seem lifted from a sci-fi novel, this technology is currently under development and holds the potential to fundamentally transform what being human means. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics, working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're talking about the book, The Five Forces That Change Everything, with author Steve Hoffman, a.k.a. Captain Hoff, the CEO of Founderspace, named one of the Forbes Top 10 Startup Accelerators. Steve is also a venture investor and serial entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. This is just really exciting to talk about your book. Can you give us a sneak preview of what these five forces are that are poised to change everything? This change is happening faster than most people expect. So what's coming are these major forces in technology that if used properly could make our lives much better. But if used irresponsibly, they could actually lead to a lot of problems for humans and for our culture and society. The first force is mass connectivity. And we've already seen the effect of this. When all of us became connected over the internet, it literally changed our lives and changed practically every business on the planet. What's coming next even have a more profound impact. And that is what happens when we connect our brains directly to the internet. So no longer are we communicating through these clunky little devices called smartphones, but literally our brains are melded with all the information that's in the cloud. Number two is bioconvergence. And we can see this happening right before our eyes. Gene editing technology is revolutionizing medicine. They now have gene editing technology that can take a person who is blind and actually cure certain types of blindness. We are gene editing our crops in multiple ways to make them taste better, to make them survive in extreme temperatures, to ward off pests. We are even gene editing the meats we eat, and that means a lot of money for some businesses. But what does gene editing mean for the human race and our planet as we start to edit ourselves and literally change the human species? Number three is human expansionism. We all hear Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and other billionaires talking about getting humans off this planet and into outer space, whether it's the moon, Mars, or beyond. This is happening in our lifetime, and it's going to have a profound impact on humanity. What will it mean for us to colonize other planets? What resources will it take away from things we can do on our planet? And as we push further out into outer space, where will our civilization, how will it mature? We're also at the same time, not just expanding out, but we're expanding in to the world of nanotechnology, to the tiniest particles possible and building nano machines that literally have the capability of reshaping our planet and the human body. Number four is deep automation. And that is where we are taking AI and robotics in literally automating everything we do in our lives, everything business does. The jobs that most people do today will not be the jobs that they do 10, 20, 30 years from now because machines will become so adept and so smart at doing everything humans do that the machines will just do it better. We are automating our entire economies, our social processes, all of these things. AI will play an enormous role in restructuring society. And then number five is the intelligence explosion. And that is where we are on the cusp of developing AI that is so smart that it will begin to code itself, increasing its intelligence and capabilities exponentially we will see an explosion in the capabilities of artificial intelligence to the point where artificial intelligence may look at human beings as we look at ants. It may have so much more knowledge and so much more capabilities. What will our society become at that point? You can look at these as trends in what you're seeing from the venture capital side. That's what I'm curious about. You're not coming at this from an academic standpoint is what prompted you to sort of think about these things and identify these things, because you're actually seeing real projects being funded. You're actually seeing products and or research in a practical sense that is in all of these areas. I am seeing it all around me every day. Before the pandemic, I was traveling 70% of my time. 
meeting with entrepreneurs, investors, and scientists all over the globe, having these discussions, talking to them about where is this technology taking us? You know, a lot of people are making a lot of money and there's a lot of changes happening, but what in a practical level is going to happen in the next decade, two decades, three decades, and how will that impact us and our lives? And what discussions should we be having? It's not a theoretical book about academics or theories. It's a book about reality. And, and projects that you're actually seeing happening and development that you're seeing. Absolutely. So these are startups like the brain computer interfaces startups, for example. I've been working with the entrepreneurs making this technology. Brain computer interfaces are also being made by some of the largest corporations in the world. And I actually consulted on this exact topic. What surprised me about some of what you wrote about is not just the corporate investment in these technologies, but the fact that some of it, particularly the biohacking, is so accessible on an individual consumer level. You talk about how for a few thousand dollars, you can set up a CRISPR editor in your garage and get to work on cuttlefish cells and that people are really taking this into their own hands to move things in whatever direction they feel they want to go. You quote one person who said, ever since I was a kid, I've been telling people I want to be a robot. And now we can implant chips in our arms and have it move a robot arm over in another country or take things into our own hands in that way. With so many different actors, corporate and individuals, pushing these technologies, is anybody at the controls? Is anybody steering the <laughs> ship? You do talk to a lot of people who voice their concerns. When you were talking with the people at MIT, they said, we believe that it's absolutely important that an everyday interface does not invade a user's private thoughts. And I thought, is that a possibility that I'm on social media and it knows what I'm thinking? And that was sort of an eye opener. These are the critical questions to be asking because these technologies are readily accessible. You don't have to be in a multi-million dollar or billion dollar lab to make, use, and deploy to the mass market. Anybody who codes, it's just a matter of knowledge. You don't even need to go to university. If you could teach yourself AI and you can be coding AI. And who knows if somebody in their basement isn't going to be the one to make the breakthrough to new algorithms that exponentially increase the power of AI and allow them to do things in the world that we've never seen. CRISPR, that gene editing technology, is both fascinating and terrifying because for a few thousand dollars, you can set up a whole CRISPR lab. I mean, you can actually buy a gene editing kit for a couple hundred dollars. It's that cheap. And all it takes is the knowledge of how to gene edit and you can start to do it in your house. Create new species of plants and animals. Well, is this wonderful? Many people have. Gene edited themselves and their friends. One guy out there, he actually injected himself with gene edited DNA to make his muscles grow faster, just like he had experimented with on frogs, getting their muscles to grow faster. I'm not telling you to do this. In fact, don't try this at home. Don't try it at home. It's extremely risky. He did it. He said he regretted doing it, but he did it. He live casted it, right? The whole process. And he sells the kits online. So he was making money. The free marketplace, the accessibility of this type of really cutting edge and powerful technology is wonderful because it accelerates innovation. But our government can't keep up with regulating this. Our government doesn't even understand the technology, let alone know how to regulate it. And the thing we need to be aware of is some of this can have huge implications. It might not just be injecting yourself. It might be releasing a new gene edited virus. God forbid somebody does this at home and then a new version of COVID or some other virus comes out. What do we do then? So part of your impetus for writing the book and thinking about these things is that a lot of what you're seeing is people come up with a process or a product or a technology in a lot of ways. They're just looking to market it or to make a profit, which is fine, but that doesn't mean you're thinking about the broader implications of what that technology might actually mean for us. How are we actually going to think about these things and maybe coax them into a positive space rather than everything ending like every bad science fiction movie I've ever seen? The blob is coming. Frankenstein is being born every day out there. The potential for both amateurs as well as entrepreneurs and well-established venture capital firms and corporations to abuse this technology is enormous. And to be fair, the potential for this technology to do wonderful things in our lives, cure cancer, gene editing technology can do that. Look at COVID, like this MNRA. We, we're fighting the virus with this technology. The technology can do enormous good. And then there are enormous risks out there. Because I've been an entrepreneur. You're under enormous pressure, financial pressure, emotional pressure. You have investors you have to deal with who have their own agenda. They want to maximize their returns. They don't want to sit around and talk about this for a year, not even two days. They want you to launch that product, get it to market, get revenue coming in, grow and beat out the competitors. They don't have time, energy, or a lot of times even the desire to do anything else. So you need counterbalances. What's to keep them in check? 
Do we have any regulations? Should we have regulations? And if so, what type of regulations? How should society view these things? Will the chance for abuse of some of the new technologies that are coming out will make Facebook look like a child's game? If a lot of this stuff is coming out of commercial development or where an entity is trying to make a product or service or technology that's going to be for profit, you might not even know that it's being developed at all if people are under non-disclosure agreements and so forth and so on. I mean, it's not even like you always have the opportunity to weigh in on the ethical or moral considerations. Companies out there aren't going to be shining the spotlight on what they're doing until they're ready. They don't want competitors copying them. They don't want regulators stepping in and thwarting their efforts. If you're running a company, you're going to keep it quiet until you're ready to go and you're going to have a specific purpose. The problem is these companies aren't necessarily trying to do evil. They're not our nemesis. What they're trying to do is literally build a business and intelligently launch products. But it's not a democratic process. It's not a process that's necessarily open to debate until those products are in the marketplace, usually. Now, there are rules around the FDA and regulation and things like that. But even those rules are sometimes flouted, especially by the smaller players. They're just putting out this stuff and seeing what happens. We're living in very exciting times. You also made the point that even if it's regulated in one country, that doesn't mean the research can't be pursued in another country. Things like human cloning that you talked about, where there are laws against it in one place, but the people who can afford to can go get their animals cloned in another country. In countries like China, their laws are different. So they may permit human cloning. They don't right now, but actually a Chinese scientist did try it. The parents were infected with HIV and they wanted the babies to resist HIV. So they actually genetically edited those babies. And that was immoral, right? Because we don't know the repercussions. We don't know what genetic damage he was introducing to those babies. And we still don't know. The scientific community was in an uproar and China's government cracked down on it. But there are scientists now in Russia, for example, that are saying if somebody wants to create a designer baby of the future, Future and not only change their eye color, but maybe change their intelligence or change their anatomy in certain ways, they can come to him and he'll do it. Has he done it? We don't know, but he's sort of hung his shingle up there and he has the knowledge and capability to do it. And all it takes is for one government to say it's okay. Any country could just say, okay, all the scientists who want to gene edit human babies can come here and anybody who has the money, which will probably be the wealthy, can come here and then they can start that business and what can we do about it? Think about it. If one country decides to create a superhuman race, the smartest children ever so that we can outcompete everybody else, and they make it a policy to gene edit babies for intelligence, then all the other countries in the world are suddenly face an existential choice. Do we look like Neanderthals? <laughs> like you're gonna be like not able to compete with this new race of superhumans? Do we have to start gene editing just to keep up? And parents, even in your own microcosm, in your school, if all the other parents are suddenly gene editing their kids, do you want your kid to be the dumbest kid in class? You know, you may not have a choice. So we have to deal with these questions before we're put in a position where we don't have a choice. You do make a good point about people choosing these things of their own free will. I know when you talked about some of the VR or AR technologies, I thought, well, sure, everybody wants a holodeck. We know there's a possibility you may lose your connection with the real world if you spend all your time on the holodeck, but heck, we still want one. And I think a lot of these technologies are like that, where it's going to be so appealing to hop on the bandwagon for so many people that the social pressure alone will create a push toward widespread adaptation. What we've learned about humans is that we don't always do what's best for us. We'll do what everybody else around us is doing just because they're doing it, because we are social animals. We do not exist in a bubble. And other times we will do stuff that's actually destructive to us, but it feels good. If you look in today's world, a lot of people would say, has your life gotten better having a smartphone? A lot of people would answer no, yet they still walk around with smartphone. It's almost impossible to have relationships and a job in the world without a smartphone today. Even if you don't like it, you're going to adopt it. Now, what happens when the devices, let's take two examples. One is I enter a virtual world that is so compelling and so lifelike that it makes my life seem dull in comparison. But when I plug into this world, all my fantasies come true. It has emotional stimulation, physical stimulation. It's just realer than real. What will a lot of people choose? You might like to say, no, I would never do that until maybe you experience it. People will be saying in the future, for better or worse, that the simulated lives and the simulated realities that are going to be coming our way are better than their real lives. And that to me is scary. Are we going to divorce ourselves from the mundane, cumbersome and painful process of living a human life, the human condition, and sort of go into this state of being that is nirvana, but sugar coated and not real? Those are questions that we have to deal with as a society and individually. 
and hopefully this podcast will answer all those questions for the listeners. And when we're finished, we will have a roadmap forward so that we don't end up in the bad science fiction movie. I want to be in the good science fiction movie. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Steve, I guess I would like to talk about a few of the trends and how they're changing who we are as humans. You talk about the brain to computer interfaces, and you talk about biohacking, and you talk about the complexity of AI systems and how they could eventually converge into consciousness. And it really gives a much different view of who we are as humans if we are humans merged with machines or if the machine that we build are evolving their own consciousness. We are on a path where our machines are becoming more like humans. They're becoming more intelligent, more capable, more independent and autonomous, and that trend will continue. At the same time, we are becoming more like our machines. It's been around for a while, so people have had pacemakers put in, people have other types of implants, diabetics have implants now that can adjust their insulin levels, but that is just the beginning. The idea that we are gonna be embedding more technology into our bodies and on our bodies is a huge force right now. So we've already seen with the Apple Watch, with Fitbit, we can get a lot of data about you know, our heart rate, our health, even detecting whether we're coming down with the flu or COVID. These technologies are very powerful, but that's nothing compared to when we start putting sensors and chips into our bodies. What will that mean for humanity? I don't know if that vision is exactly correct, and I can tell you that vision is flawed because as soon as human beings take that leap and let's say implant a chip into our brain that allows us to think thoughts, trigger things on the internet, pull down information as fast as we would pull up our own memories and interact with supposedly some sort of future brain computer operating system, which is an AI out there that can interface between ourselves and all this information out on the internet. What does that mean for us? Well, on the positive side, yes, we could have superhuman powers. We can literally have memories that are infinite. We can have processing powers equivalent to a computer. And we know computers can massively process data in a way that no human can compete with. But at the same time, what happens to our self, our thoughts, when that chip enables others potentially from the outside to influence what we're thinking? This data, how will they use that data? And what happens if there are nefarious players out there who actually start to hack your own thoughts, potentially rewrite your memories, or influence you in ways that you are unaware of? If you are unaware that you are being manipulated because you have this device in your brain, do you lose a sense of yourself, a sense of free agency, or is it much more subtle? So these are some of the questions I start to bring up and grapple with. That's what I was thinking about is uh, if I had the chip in my brain, it would be running like a really old OS, right? <laughs> and I would keep getting alerts in my eyeballs that would be like, you have to upgrade your operating system. This will no longer be supported, right? What do you do then? It's going to be really interesting on multiple levels. So first of all, you're putting something in your brain that you won't own because whoever manufactures that brain chip will own it. And it may not have to be in your brain. So a lot of people say, I don't want to get a chip in my brain. Well, if you have Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, or you've had a stroke and you're completely paralyzed, then you might opt for a brain chip. Most of us would probably say no way. But they're going to be coming out with, and they're developing right now, DARPA, the branch of the US military that funded the development of the internet, is now funding non-invasive computer brain interfaces that are literally like headphones. Like you can literally put them on, they might be part of your glasses, and they will actually read your brain waves. So we will become very dependent upon these devices, whether they're actually embedded in us or we're just wearing them, they will become part of us. And we may not be able to function in a future society without them. 
but it's going to be taken to a whole nother level. It's going to be exponentially more disturbing when those are your thoughts. Let's say you are storing your thoughts, your memories in this cloud database so that you can retrieve them later. We all know our memories are fallible, but people may choose to save the original memory to the cloud so it's preserved in its pristine form. And they can not only download it, they can like experience that memory much more richly than our own limited memories are capable of. But if you upload that, there may be terms and conditions attached to it. You may not even own your own memories. And people may also be licensing out your memories, of course, with your permission, because you're getting this brain experience for free, the storage for free. You don't want to pay for it. So they are entitled to mine your memories. They are entitled to maybe resell your memories to other people who want to experience those things. There could be a host of legal problems like we never imagined possible. The fascinating part is, imagine I could connect to my grandmother and actually download her memories from her childhood. Wow, wouldn't that be amazing? And she could upload, start uploading all her memories for generations to come. Imagine if I could connect to my favorite pop star and as they go on stage for the big concert, I can look through their eyes and actually be on stage with them, not watching them, but with them. What would I pay to do that? Imagine if I could connect to the brain of a dolphin and swim through the ocean and get some of that experience. So these potentialities are out there. They're waiting to happen. The legal framework, the social framework, and everything else that goes with it, totally undeveloped, and we are totally unprepared. There's so many privacy and ethical implications, like under what circumstances could your memories be seized by law enforcement, for example? And it might not even be because you were accused of a crime. It may be because you were an eyewitness. And in the current world, you can decline. I mean, maybe you get subpoenaed, but in the end, you have a lot of agency over how you might participate in a legal proceeding. But if everything's getting uploaded all the time, then that's not necessarily an option, let alone the marketing potential. It's crazy. I went to Toronto University, and in Toronto University, they're working on this technology right now. It's a non-invasive brain-computer interface that can literally capture images from your head and put them on a computer. And the professor developing this, one of the things he said, well, this could be used in courts of law. You could literally take witnesses, take suspects, and extract visual images while you're questioning them from their brains and record those as potential evidence. That technology is being developed today in the lab. And I can guarantee you that as it's perfected, this technology will find uses. We've already seen in our courts of law that people are using AI and big data to determine whether criminals should be released on parole. So this data is being used today, and some of the data is biased. You get to where we could tap people's memories and tap people's brains. It's going to be very, very tricky. Well, it seems like there's a lot of convergence of all these five forces. I mean, you talk about the improvement of robotics and how it's easy to make the connection. If you have a brain-computer interface, you can be a person controlling a robot body or an exoskeleton or a remote machine somewhere. And I guess the other one that I was thinking about is if we have this and we have the quantum computing, then all of a sudden there's enough computing power to really process all the raw data that all of us will be producing with our brain computer interfaces. And so then you get into huge sort of societal surveillance problems. Like you said, if they're bundling up our data now just with our social media activity and the cookies we're accepting on the internet, what are they going to do with our data when they have all of it, when they have all of our experiences and our memories and so on and so forth? You do get into the legal question of robot personhood. You know, when we have machines or more complex AIs, where do we put the line on emergence of sentience? It sort of made me question whether we're seeing a different kind of class structure emerging. Maybe on the one end, you're going to have these very fully enhanced humans going all the way down to the unenhanced humans, but then the robots will be the second class citizens that everybody can look down on. But I'm just wondering how you see that all shaking out, the different levels of humans or the different levels of personhood. In a world with mass connectivity, there will be lots of issues surrounding who gets the technology. So some of this technology may be really advanced and very specialized and quite expensive. So some people may be able to get these brain-computer interfaces that are super advanced, that augment their ability to function at a very high level, allowing them to compete and outcompete most other people and therefore gain access to the benefits of society. We, as a society, need to make sure that this technology is distributed equitably so that all of us can share in the benefits. But that isn't necessarily how it will function. 
you know, already today, if you have lots of money, you can get lots of things that other people can't. You can buy super expensive cars, you can buy your way into high level meetings with governments, and the privilege doesn't end. But in a world where this technology is so powerful, it's going to really enable a certain class of people with wealth to guarantee that their kids are really outperform everybody else <laughs> because they have access to this. The other question we also need to really consider deeply is let's say we bring the cost down and we distribute on a mass level these brain computer interfaces to everybody. Is that a good thing? Well, the positives are number one, it could accelerate learning which could be really cool. Like you could literally have a brain computer interface that could program your brain to learn a language while you sleep. Or these brain computer interfaces could allow people to accelerate 12 years of education in maybe three or four years. They could literally download that much information and get that much information. Or they may be able to skip education entirely because all the information is out there a thought away. Why do you need it in your head when it's a thought away? But then who owns this information? Is it yours? Is it not yours? Can somebody turn off the spigot and suddenly you're stupid again? People are going to want to own this information and they're going to want to exact a price for this information. So there's going to be a whole economy around that. Will certain people have access to other information other people don't? We already live in a world where if you have money, you can get access to certain information which gives you power that other people don't. Let's say you want to opt out of this. Let's say you're in the workplace, you're going to your job and you say, I don't want people reading my thoughts. I don't want them to do this. But then everybody else in your job has a brain computer interface and they're performing at an extremely high level. Could you even keep that job? Would your colleagues all look down on you because like get with the program, like we, we're all doing all this amazing work and here you are, this regular human? You're living in the stone age, you're not contributing at all. We have already seen in today's world that we had to give up an enormous amount of our own privacy just to participate in the modern world. And the pressures are extreme to do so, I think. No individual, unless you are satisfied with being an outcast, completely on the periphery of what's going on, could resist both the temptation and the pressure, right? The temptation is that, yeah, we all want to be better. We all want to do more. I want to be smarter. I want to remember everything. I want to download all the information in the world at my fingertips. We all want this. And at the same time, even if we don't want it, everybody else will have it. And where does that leave us? I want to just follow up on the one thing that you said, which is you did talk about, should we distribute this more equitably to people? It seemed to be a question that you want to grapple with. Do you think that there is a mechanism for doing that to prevent only the wealthiest people from initially having these kind of technologies? I mean, is that like a government regulation thing? How would you actually propose getting that done? When the government steps in, we need to consider it carefully. There's a normal progression with most technology. The first versions come out, they're very expensive. A few with the money and access can get these technologies earlier. Like in Silicon Valley, everybody who had money and also knew about the iPhone and stuff, they were the first to get on the smartphone bandwagon. And then it spreads out. My prediction is the same thing is going to happen with brain computer interfaces. They're going to be accessible by a few, but then quickly because the free market is the best way to get this technology mass distributed. The real question I have is not whether it should be mass distributed. I think it inevitably will wherever there's money to be made and there's a lot of money because if you think about companies that control the ecosystem today, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they control our computer operating systems. So first it was Microsoft and Apple with the desktop operating systems. Now with mobile, it's Apple and Google. They have enormous power. The company that invents the brain computer interface, the first company to invent the brain computer interface that is truly mass market and develops a brain operating system, they will dominate the market. They will be the gatekeepers and that company will want to distribute it everywhere. The real question we need to ask is not will everybody get this, but should we get this? Is this a technology that is going to benefit us? Yes, it will make us smarter. Yes, it will make us more productive. Yes, it will allow us to do amazing things like connect with each other, maybe even exchange emotions. But at the same time, it literally opens us up to exposing our brains and everything that goes on within them as data. It literally opens us up to the possibility of people using that data to manipulate us. And it could mean giving up our own autonomy. Is that a world we want to live in where we don't even know if we're being controlled? Well, hopefully with the aid of thinkers such as yourself, we can grapple with some of these questions ahead of time before we're playing catch up, which is what it seems like we do so often. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you, Steve, for talking about the future of humanity today. I guess I would like to start this segment talking about AI. In your book, you talk about a few examples. One is uh, just running a city with AI. And so the AI supports hiring and it manages traffic flow and all these sorts of things more efficiently than humans. And another one was farming with AI, which we know is becoming a bigger and bigger deal because you can use GPS and you can use robotic farm equipment and send things out and manage the water and manage the pesticides on a very granular level, which is better for food production. But I felt some deep deep anxiety because when the family farm becomes a relic of the past because all the farming's done by robots, who owns our food? Who's making the decisions? I guess there are two questions. One is without humans in the system, do the AIs just run unchecked? And do we end up with baking in inequities in our system? And the other one is, if we turn the control over to AIs, isn't that concentrating power outside of our own hands? We live in a very strange world right now. Power is already being concentrated. So the days of the family farmer, they're gone because most of our food is being produced by big corporations. They just buy up a massive amount of land, they control the water rights, they control all these new technologies. Monsanto, you know, is gene editing, and it's hard to compete as a little guy. But where we're headed next is that these big corporations, their goal is to maximize profits. They've gotten rid of the family farm as a real competitor. The real question is how do they make even more money? And that is by getting rid of humans in the process. Already there's robots out there that are picking fruit, even fruit as delicate as berries. They have machines now that can do this. In the UK, they're experimenting with entirely robotized farms, like literally no humans from the time you plant the seeds to the time you harvest it. There'll be both indoor farms that are completely automated. There's startups around the globe launching these to big outdoor farms that are run completely by robots. We live in a world where literally everything that can be automated will be automated. And I call this deep automation. It's going really deep. Every process, everything that we thought only humans could do, robots and AI will be able to do this in the future. It's just a matter of time. Even the most artistic things like creating amazing paintings, they have robots now that create a painting and they put it in front of art experts and the art experts literally cannot tell whether it was created by a robot or human. So us as lay people, whether it's a painting or music, the same thing for music, composing classical music that experts couldn't tell if it was composed by some classic musician they had never heard of or an AI. They couldn't tell and we won't be able to tell for sure. Already companies like Spotify are going out there and developing AI now that can make music because they don't want to pay royalties to real people who make music. They'd rather have royalty-free music generated by an AI and if people like it and consume it, they're even putting fake band names up there on Spotify. This stuff is happening today. They're experimenting with it. It's not mass market yet, but it's only a matter of time before these experiments actually make a lot of economic sense for these companies. I do wonder about some of the intellectual property stuff. I mean, just with an example that you mentioned, Monsanto. I mean, Monsanto has their copyrighted seeds that works with their copyrighted pesticides. And there have been cases internationally where they've prosecuted farmers for trying to reuse the seeds or trying to keep their own seed banks. And so what happens when you have this sort of deep automation or you have these art or music or food that's being produced by by a company, and what happens with the intellectual property? What happens with the prosthesis that you don't have the right to repair? AI and machines will become inseparable from every aspect of our lives and society. A lot of these things that humans used to directly control, we will only indirectly control. For example, the power grid. We're using AI now to manage the power grid. It can do a great job, but humans won't necessarily be in the loop in all of these processes where we completely automate everything. We as human beings aren't designed to process massive amounts of data and make sense of it because we don't process statistics that well. AI processes it perfectly. And so AI in a lot of these situations, especially where they're market driven situations, the AI will be able to process it, make sense of it really quickly and make a decision and usually make the decision with an outcome that it thinks is right for humanity. The question we have to ask is, is that outcome really beneficial for us? Is that what we really want? Because more and more governments, corporations, organizations will be delegating their decision making to AI. If they want to compete, they have to outsource it to AI. 
in the near future, it won't have a will of its own. It will do whatever it was told to do. And if it produces results that contradict what those people want, then they can change those parameters. What really worries me is when it comes to our personal decision making. And this is a whole nother level of deep automation. Think about your own life and the choices you make as an individual. There will come a point where you can literally go to an AI and say, find me a job. If you've ever looked for a job, and I have, it's a pain, like going out there and sending your resumes to companies and getting rejected or getting no response. And what, what am I a right fit for? I know there's a job out there for me, but I can't put my talents on a resume, right? They just don't fit. But an AI that exists on your smartphone really knows what you're good at, what you're amazing at, what your weak spots are. It may be able to go out into the world of jobs, working with corporates and their AIs, talking to them what they need and what you are and find the perfect match for you. So you're like, great, I will invite this AI into my life and let it tell me what's the best career path for me. That's just one decision. Let's say a lot of people are on dating apps these days. You flipping through all these people trying to find the right match, super pain, right? People don't respond and when they respond, you know, they ghost you and then somebody go out on a date and then it, of course it doesn't work because it wasn't the right match. They were just happened to be the one that responded. Not a good process. So they will go to an AI. The AI will look at both people very deeply because it exists on their phone. It's following them every day. It's gathering tons of data on them, right? And match those people better than you could ever. So you would invite that AI into your life. We will begin to invite AIs into our life, not just to make little decisions like what should I watch on Netflix tonight, but life changing decisions like our career, our future life partner, all of these things. If the AI does it so well, we're going to have a better life. But we aren't making these decisions. The AI is literally making the most important decisions in our life. Is that the world we want to live in? You have a great quotation in your book. We are continually having a dialogue with ourselves and our heads. Why shouldn't we invite an advanced AI to join those conversations? And that sort of gives me hope for a little bit of free will inserted in that. Just because the AI suggests something doesn't mean that you're going to have to do it, right? I like to think of it like this. You don't have to do it. And honestly, going out on a bad date or having to struggle with a relationship that isn't perfect and improve yourself and learn to empathize with the other person and see things through their eyes, that's not a bad thing. That's how we grow as human beings. If we take those decisions out, if we take the idea of making a mistake out of our lives, we might be losing something very valuable in our own personal growth and experience bringing up some of what you see with the algorithms that choose playlists is to me always the primary example because I still listen to the radio, right? I listen to the public radio station here where there's actual DJs that play music. Now, I also listen to essentially algorithmically programmed playlists, but the difference is in the one case, I know I'll always hear what I like. In the other case, I get challenged occasionally. I hear things that are surprising. My ears are challenged. And it's actually how I end up discovering new music that I might not have come across anyway. But that to me is like, I've made a choice where I don't just let Spotify curate my playlist. I'm curious with some of this in mind, there's a corollary question, which is at a certain point with the AIs, presuming that there's some kind of singularity where some of these AIs achieve a true sentience or consciousness, then you've got a whole separate set of questions, which is, you don't have to do what the AI tells you to, but what if that AI is actually in a position of authority, legally speaking? Well, if I go to work for a particular company, I may have to enter into a contract where I'm bound by the AI's decisions, the same way that you might be bound by a arbitration agreement. AIs will be really interesting in the future because there will come a point where these AIs have real power over our life and our decision-making. You might not agree with what the AI wants, but can you argue with the AI? We are at the point now where we are giving managers in corporations AI tools to assist them because the AI can gather lots of information on their employees, determine how people are feeling and predict how people will react. And for example, corporations are deploying these AI now in HR that will alert them if they think an employee is likely to leave the job so that they can intervene before that employee leaves the job. But the next step is that we will have AIs that will literally be our bosses. If you ask most people, would you rather have an AI boss or a human boss? And the majority of people said, give me an AI boss. Why? The humans are emotional, right? Humans can put pressure on you. Humans can get angry and shout at you. Your real human boss might not have time to listen to you. If you have an AI boss, they'll never get angry. They'll always have time to listen to you. They'll be patient. They'll help you out. They'll share information. These AI bosses might be incredibly good managers. But at a certain point, 
these AI bosses are your bosses. And so if they think you're underperforming, they may fire you. And their job is to make the company more efficient, and they will be making the hiring decisions. That's an example of an AI that will have enormous influence over you. If you get mad at your AI boss, who do you turn to? My AI boss discriminates because it's using data that is based on society that, and that data is inherently biased. We already see this. AIs can be as biased as people because they're going to be as biased as the data they're fed. And it doesn't even take sentient AIs for this. We have a lot of AIs in our world, right? And you talk about some of our personal assistants. I mean, my house is filled with personal robotic assistants everywhere, and I love them, right? They're great. They're good friends. But I don't fool myself that my Alexas are working for anybody but Amazon or that my Dots are working for anybody but Google. If I had an AI and I said, oh, AI, I need a good job, and the AI says, oh, go work as a warehouse worker for Amazon, I don't know that that AI is working for me or working for the corporation that built it. When we're looking at a society-wide rollout of these AIs, how do we know who's sort of setting the baseline or creating the algorithms? How do we know what the AIs are designed to optimize? I guess I'm wondering how we can shift the scales a little bit in our favor looking at rollout of corporate created AIs. In the future we're entering, all of these AIs will be built by somebody and controlled by somebody. They may offer us enormous value in our life, but with that comes a price because whoever built and owns and runs that AI will have programmed that AI to serve their ends. As AIs become even more integrated and indispensable to our lives, each of those AIs will be programmed to maximize the value for their owners. Those AIs will be beholden to other people and other objectives, and your interests will probably be far down on their list. And that is why we need to have this discussion. We need to actually bring to the surface and make more transparent what decisions are these algorithms making and why in a way that people can understand. If I engage on Facebook, what is that AI's motive? Or what are they trying to get me to do? If society is going to step in there, we need to start to make these more transparent. There need to be rules about how it's happening, and then you need to be able to influence by what criteria these AI make their decisions so that it can make your life actually better and in more in your own interest instead of in somebody else's. We can only hope. That is right. We can only hope I am out there talking about this because we are at the tip of this iceberg. If we don't talk about this now, it's literally going to be impossible later because these AIs are going to offer us so much utility, so much value that we are just going to accept them. We're going to say, yes, give me more AIs. I want AIs to do everything. I don't want to you know, have to worry about any aspect of my life, from my health care to my child's education to my relationship with my friends and my wife or husband. We're going to ask AI to intervene on all of these. And in all of these, that AI is going to have its own objectives. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking about all these amazing sci-fi scenarios that are happening today across the globe. One of the things that struck me was a phrase when you're talking about if you have brain-computer interfaces and you have these AIs that can really crunch a lot of data, already we're seeing a lot of surveillance in our public spaces. Recording equipment everywhere, of course we all carry around our cameras and our recording 
and equipment. You say in public spaces, many of the rights and privileges that we have taken for granted are on the verge of disappearing. And it seems like the closer we get to computers and the more powerful we make our computers processing power, the more we're slipping into this total surveillance state without really grappling with the issues of privacy and security that we would need to keep ourselves safe. In another point you talk about, would you want to be with a lover if you knew your lover had a brain computer interface and everything they did was being recorded? It's hard to know where to draw the line with your own personal privacy and with privacy in general. Do you have a right to privacy if you're in a public space? There are many people out there who are saying right now that we have entered the post-privacy era, meaning you as an individual are no longer entitled to any privacy or anonymity. And that is going to be monumental change for humanity. Ever since humans existed, you know, we could wander off into the jungle or go somewhere and not have other people necessarily knowing what we did. Cash itself is disappearing. What this means is that if you want to buy something, all these transactions will be recorded. If you want to go somewhere, like in public parks and cities around the world, there are not just cameras everywhere, there are listening devices too, and these are going up more and more. So when you're inside a store, when you're outside a store, when you're in your home, there's Alexa and Google Home and all these IoT devices listening. When you're at work, there are devices listening. When you're on your smartphone, you're being tracked anyway, everywhere you go. And all the interactions you do online are being tracked. We are being recorded. That is a fact. And it's only going to get more because there are billions of new internet connected devices with sensors being deployed every year. AIs can actually see the pattern in them and recognize them. Our voices, like all of us have very unique voice imprints. You know, everything about us is unique. Even the way you carry your phone, even the words you use, all of these things are digital signatures of people that can identify them. So keeping any sense of your own privacy is going away. And if you think this is a little disturbing, the real question is how are they going to use this data? They have AIs now that can track your eye movements and literally determine your personality from them. Are you neurotic? Are you calm? MIT just released a device that can bounce waves off of you, electronic waves, and actually determine how you're feeling emotionally inside. Are you anxiety ridden? Are you happy? Are you angry? So for example, you may walk into a store and they detect that you're likely to shoplift and then they may send over a clerk to watch you. What does that mean? Like, what are you basing this on? Are you basing it on the camera and looking at my skin color? Or are you basing it on my movements? Is that data biased? Will certain groups of people, when they enter stores, be monitored very closely? If you are likely to buy, are you likely to buy expensive items or the bargain items? So all of customer service may be based on this. Your whole interaction with the world and how people start to treat you may be based on these AIs gathering information on you. In the future, when we walk up to other people, they may hold up their smartphone. It will make a determination about us, whether they could trust you, whether you're a good match for them. We are, in a sense, though, talking about first world technologies, to my mind, in terms of seeing these deployed now, seeing these deployed in the next 10 years. Something we haven't addressed too much, we talked a little bit about class in an earlier segment in terms of obviously wealthier people being able to adopt certain technologies sooner and so forth. But it seems to me that you're still going to have huge swaths of the world where these technologies may not be deployed. Is it possible that those will be your new privacy havens? Unfortunately, I don't think you can run off to Africa and hope for privacy because these technologies are highly scalable. Meaning once you build that AI that functions in America, it's built. <laughs> you could just deploy it in Africa. We've already seen in Africa and India, the smartphone rate adoption go through the roof. Like you go into a rural village in India or in China and they have smartphones. Like they might not have a television, but they have a smartphone because it's so useful. So we are going to see these technologies deploy very quickly on a mass scale. 
The question is, who owns the technologies, right? Big multinational corporations will be the ones deploying these on scale. And they will be the ones owning the data. They will be owning and deploying the technology. And ultimately, they will be reaping most of the benefit. That is what we're going to see. So there will be no privacy haven unless you isolate yourself in your house and totally unplug. The issues seem pretty well defined or the questions seem pretty well defined. So have you looked at or do you have suggestions for actually addressing these issues before they come to fruition? You know, we've talked about how if you have a corporation and their goal is to maximize profit, not necessarily improve humanity or maintain privacy. It doesn't mean, like we said in the first segment, that they're nefarious, but their agenda is often driven by profit and return to shareholders and, and an innovation cycle. But where is the solution to sort of corral these ethical and moral considerations? I mean, does this need to be corporations all agreeing to a certain best practice? Does it need to be government regulation? Does there need to be a supranational UN type agency that sort of regulates these kind of things? Have you identified any solutions? I've thought very deeply about this. We can't rely solely on corporations to police themselves. Their mission is to maximize shareholder value, right? To make money for whoever controls those shares. That is what they're gonna do first and foremost. Some corporations are run by enlightened people, but those are more the exception than the rule. What we've seen in society is that corporations respond to pressures from other groups. There are four main forces in society, right? There's the corporate force, then you have government, which balances that out so that the corporations don't pollute, poison people, so that they act responsibly. If the government doesn't make those rules, there will always be corporations that do whatever is in their best interest, even when it causes great harm. But you can't just rely on government because government, again, responds to people. And so there's the citizens. One of my jobs is to educate people because if people don't demand it, if it's not raised in their consciousness, they're not gonna ask their elected politicians to make these changes. And then there's a third thing, and that's where you guys come in, and that's the media. The media is the other force for balancing these things out. The media brings truth. The media shines a spotlight. The media can influence public opinion and actually get people to take action. So all of these together have to work in concert. How do we chart a path forward? Well, first we need to raise the issues. We need to debate and discuss the issues so that our legislators can focus on it so that they can make the laws and also we can make decisions responsibly and influence our peers. And you can see a lot has been done in society to make it a better place. I mean, we now have much more rights for people around the world. You know, women and oppressed people have more rights than they've had in the past. We used to have slavery, we don't, you know, we are making progress, you know, even though it feels like we're going backwards sometimes. We have to remember, we have the power to make these changes. We are the generation that can make these changes. We still have our freedom. What I'm worried about and what I write about in The Five Forces is that if we don't step up to the plate and do our duty by future generations, we may not have the ability to make changes. A lot of these technologies concentrate power extremely in a few hands, allow governments and large entities to really control people in ways that they've never been controlled before. So if we don't step forward with our democracy now and actually start to think through these issues and really come up with solutions, we may pass the point of no return. Fundamentally, what we need to do are raise these issues, demand transparency in how all of these technologies are being used, and then actually figure out what we want as a society, what is right for us as both individuals and as members of this society. I'm just curious, and maybe you don't know, but one of the things that you've talked about is this sort of whack-a-mole, like let's say in the US and the EU, we say, you know what, we're not gonna let Google create the city running AI because we need it to be more neutral or whatever. But the Google city running AI is so cheap that it gets adopted in Chad and the Sudan and wherever. And so you've got this sort of global whack-a-mole is there an international advisory, like a trusted group 
of people internationally whose word is trusted on these issues. I'm sort of thinking of the UN has these sort of councils that will say, you know, here's the information on women and children, or here's the information on poverty and hunger. Is there a technology council, an advisory council that gives people information? Is there one place people can go, like a congressional research service sort of thing, where people can get this information? Unfortunately, there is no single organization or body that everybody trusts. And we live in a world today, especially with the internet, much of it false, where people don't know what to trust. A blogger has the same megaphone as the New York Times or the Washington Post. And the blogger may be just saying completely fabricated things. And when people read this and consume this, a lot of times they'll believe the blogger over you know, well-researched things like that are coming from the United Nations or the EPA. So we are facing a crisis of truth right now. Where is the actual information? What institutions do we believe in to help us guide and navigate this very tricky path forward? Fortunately, we have a lot of institutions that are capable of helping disseminate truth verify information, dispel all this erroneous facts and misinformation, you know, everything from universities, our top universities, to well-run government agencies, to international organizations, NGOs, the United Nations, different groups around the world. There are a lot of them, but hopefully we can use some of this technology to actually solve some of the problems it creates. For example, one of the bright sides of AI is that there is the potential that we could have instant verification of information we're getting. So let's say we build a trusted AI that works in real time. So when a politician comes up there and the politician starts spewing lies, we could literally have an AI that you can look at as a subcaption flagging in real time all the lies that are going so that people can say, oh my God, like this is total b right? You know? little, little floating red X's. Yeah, yeah, like over their mouth, their mouth like liar, <laughs> liar, liar, or their nose can grow yes. yeah. in proportion to the lie. What I would like to see technologists do is start to address some of the social problems we're having. We're never going to be able to solve all our social problems because society is always changing. Technology is always evolving. There will always be new problems we have, but we can take steps. If we as people say, look, you know, I'm a smart person. I'm a coder. I can go out and code this. I can get other people involved. We can start new types of networks to counterbalance the problems I'm seeing, new types of privacy networks using the blockchain or other technologies that can safeguard our information, hardware, where we can store stuff locally. Every problem we create by technology, we have the potential to solve with social organization using technology responsibly. So I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I tend to be optimistic. I really think we can have a great future. I want a holodeck and a replicator. I do. But it sounds like for now, it's up to all of us to do our homework on all this while we still have free will, right? We do, and we are going to be entering a really fun, amazing time. We could immerse ourselves in other worlds and have experiences that we could never have in our own life, like these virtual simulated worlds. We can have brain-computer interfaces where I, for the first time, cannot just empathize with you, but if I have a brain-computer interface, potentially you could transmit your emotions to me, and I could actually feel what you feel. These things are amazing. So as scary as some of the things I pointed out, there's also this equally opposite wonderful side that will increase our ability to experience our lives in the world in ways we never thought possible. I think that's a really positive note to end this segment on. I want to hold on to that positivity about these new horizons. Steve, this has just been a fascinating discussion. I've really, really enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. For more information about Steve Hoffman and his work, you can visit captainhoff.com. That's captain, H-O-F-F dot com. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council, produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.